All right, Anthony. And we are set, ready to go. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us tonight um, for this really exciting event. We have a lot of ground to cover, so I'll jump right in. Uh, 2020 was the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth in 1770 in the city of Bonn. And before the pandemic upended our world, um, hundreds of events had been planned all around the world, uh, televised tributes, marathon performances, exhibitions, and countless other celebrations. In Germany, the government had earmarked 27 million euro for the occasion. Uh, for LVB 2020, no expenses had been spared. Incidentally, another epoch-defining German, the philosopher Hegel, was born the same year and also celebrated his 250th birthday. But you'd be forgiven for not being aware, poor Georg Wilhelm Friedrich barely got a nod outside his native Stuttgart. But although 2020 was a cursed year, and despite the fact that our commemorative spirit was thwarted, and we now have to wait until 2027, which is the 200th anniversary of Beethoven's death, to, for another round of celebrations, uh, thankfully, we could still turn to books. And the publishing world did not disappoint. By all accounts, some of the best books written on Beethoven came out last year, some bringing new archival documents to light, others offering new insights into the composer's life, his career, his political beliefs, and of course, his music and legacy. All of them showing that Beethoven scholarship is alive and well, and that well into the 21st century, the composer and his music continue to fascinate us, move us, at, time, at times overwhelm us, and sometimes even to put a contemporary spin on it, trigger us. With us tonight to discuss Beethoven, we have four authors who published a Beethoven book, or even two in 2020. Uh, Mark Evan Bonds, a Carrie Bosshammer Distinguished Professor of Music at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, former editor in chief of Beethoven Forum and the author of Beethoven Variations on the Life and also the Beethoven Syndrome. Conductor and musicologist Jan Kers, uh, who is the music director of the Beethoven Orchestra Le Conseil Olympique, based in Belgium, but performing internationally, and also the author of Beethoven Alive. Author and music scholar William Kinderman, professor, professor of music, um, Leo M. Klein and Elaine Crown Klein Chair in Performance Studies at UCLA who's a specialist of Mozart, Beethoven, and Wagner, and the author of Beethoven, a political artist in revolutionary times, and Laura Tunbridge, professor of music at the University of Oxford, an expert on German romanticism and vocal and chamber music, and the author of Beethoven, A Life in Nine Pieces. Last but not least, um, the conductor of tonight's quartet is Alex Ross, Alex is the New Yorker's music critic and the author of the wonderful the rest, of, the rest is Noise, Listening to the 20th Century, for which he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. His latest book is Wagnerism, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music, a study of the Wagner myth or cult or phenomenon uh, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, which has already been, which has been called, quote, a superb example of cultural history and has already garnered more awards and accolades that we have time to mention here. Um, in a recent New Yorker piece, Alex enjoined us to keep Beethoven weird, and that sounds like a great pro program for tonight's conversation. Um, so before I hand it over to Alex, I want to mention that since we have four speakers tonight, we may not have time to take audience questions. Over to you, Alex. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it is a delight uh, to be here with this very distinguished uh, gathering of scholars. Um, and it's also uh, a delight to be uh, virtually back at 192 Books, um, which is a fantastic uh, bookstore in the Chelsea uh, neighborhood of uh, 
Manhattan. Uh, I used to uh, live in the area um, and uh, would, would come to the store all the time and uh, did events for my first two books there. Um, and so I urge uh, anyone who's not acquainted with the store uh, uh, to visit uh, and of course generally to support uh, your independent bookstores um, in this time of monopoly um, and uh, kind of over centralization of the publishing business. But in any case, uh, I will uh, jump right in. Um, I, I did write this piece uh, last month uh, for the New Yorker for, for uh, the website uh, talking about uh, recent uh, Beethoven publications, um, I, I gathered actually no fewer than 10 uh, uh, new books uh, about Beethoven, and in fact there were more uh, beyond that, um, but uh, the, the books that, uh, that all of you wrote uh, were particularly uh, outstanding in that group, and it's just uh, wonderful that um, that 192 uh, books um, has managed to, to bring you all together for this uh, discussion. So uh, I'm gonna begin by, by asking um, each of our panelists uh, to talk a bit about uh, their book um, and to sort of introduce the, the major concepts behind the books. Uh, and then we'll branch out and hopefully have a, a, a rich and, and um, interactive discussion um, about uh, all things Beethovenian. Uh, but I want to start with uh, Jan, uh, whose book is um, a, a very rich um, and, and very fresh <clears throat> uh, biography uh, of, of Beethoven. So we'll begin with the purely biographical and then uh, branch out to more interpretive uh, matters. But uh, as it's not a new biography, it was uh, first published in uh, Dutch in 2009, uh, is that correct? Um, uh, and there was a, a German edition, uh, which was uh, very successful. Um, and so finally, um, the uh, English, uh, much awaited English translation uh, has uh, come out uh, and giving us, giving English readers uh, uh, access uh, to this uh, very uh, important, uh, extremely uh, up-to-date uh, study. And, and uh, I gather you have updated it uh, further for this uh, English uh, edition uh, since the Dutch publication. Um, of, there are, of course, uh, untold numbers of, uh, of Beethoven biographies uh, already uh, in existence. What, what led you to, to feel that, that we really did need uh, a new one? Uh, and what are some of the, the, the major themes that, that you found yourself uh, emphasizing, uh, sort of particular aspects of this enormously famous uh, figure uh, as you put your biography together. Uh, yes, thank you for your nice introduction and your nice words. Um, I have many things to, to, to tell about it, you have many questions. Uh, but first of all, uh, so um, although I'm very overjoyed that, that my book has received such widespread international attention, but um, it may surprise you to know that for me, uh, writing a biography of Beethoven was uh, never about realizing a long cherished dream uh, or ambition. Mm -hmm. uh, quite the contrary, in fact, uh, I have the feeling that chance and circumstance played uh, a major part in the process. Um, what I can't deny is that uh, Beethoven has always occupied a, a special place in my life. Uh, I have always enjoyed uh, conducting his music uh, and I have done so often. Uh, and as a university professor, um, I've always used his um, piano sonatas as a the basis for teaching music analysis to my students. Uh, so in doing so, I, I followed in the footsteps of uh, Amal Schoenberg, who said uh, that to understand the structure of Beethoven's sonatas is to understand the principles governing all music, uh, or indeed all art. Um, <laughs> and then, um, because I felt that I could simply never learn enough about Beethoven, I systematically purchased every book about, um, about him that crossed my path. 
um, in the same way that some uh, tourists collect um, teaspoons or, or mugs. Uh, my custom in every new major city was to, to, to scour and plunder the local bookstores for any material on Beethoven that I could find. Um, uh, the consequence is that I now have a private Beethoven collection uh, numbering nearly 1,000 books. So you, you can see here behind me that that's uh, uh, all uh, Beethoven. It was uh, it was of great value to me uh, when writing the, bio the biography, as it was at my disposal a day and night. But I say again, uh, amassing this collection was not part of any concrete strategy intended to pave the way to writing a major bi biography. And that changed in, in 2004, uh, when I took a break from both uh, my conducting and academic career um, to write a Beethoven manifest. Um, that document was intended to serve as an, let's say, uh, intellectual underpinning to my conducting activities which I had decided should focus more on the works of Beethoven. And it all got a little out of hand, however, uh, outgrowing the dimensions of a 200 page manifest and becoming a nearly 800 page book, which took me not one, but five years to write. Okay, Beethoven very quickly proved to be a very captivating and uh, inspiring subject. Uh, his life story contains all the necessary ingredients. It speaks to the imagination that, let's say, someone from some such humble beginnings, uh, especially uh, at the turn of the 19th century, became uh, world famous. Um, that's very fascinating. Eh? Um, and then, yeah, okay, at least as impressive, however, is the unique path that uh, Beethoven taught as an artist. Uh, um, perhaps I, I propose that, that later on in this, in this session, I can explain a little bit more in detail what, what the, the, the more technical things of, of the biography. Uh, but um, you have many levels um, when writing such a uh, biography, but perhaps we can later on speak about uh, those levels. Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> I'm back. Uh, uh, that's that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, and we will come back and, and delve in, in more detail. Uh, but let me I just turn to uh, Laura now uh, to introduce um, her book, uh, Beethoven, A Life in Nine Pieces. Um, and so you've taken uh, a different approach, uh, not to uh, kind of uh, move through the life uh, year by year, uh, event by event, uh, but to, to refract Beethoven's life through, uh, I think, a very uh, strikingly and in some ways uh, surprisingly uh, chosen uh, array of, of his works. And so could you explain uh, what led you to sort of um, develop that that kind of uh, particular private canon uh, of, of Beethoven pieces? Why why these works uh, were particularly uh, useful in transmitting uh, the the overall portrait of Beethoven, which is which is very like Jan's book, very rich, very very varied, uh, uh, kind of resisting the many of the usual cliches uh, attached to the uh, image of of Beethoven. Thanks. Uh, one thing I was really aware of starting this book was actually that there didn't need to be another big book. I mean, there are books like Jan's already in the world. And so what I was trying to do was to find a way to introduce aspects of Beethoven's life and works without pretending to cover everything. And I decided that actually honing in on the music and centering it around nine pieces was a way to both manage the material and also give glimpses of different ways of thinking about Beethoven 
And also something that really interests me is the kind of music that we are drawn towards from Beethoven's corpus, some of which um, is music that was very popular during his day, but is now less well known and vice versa. And those value judgments that are made along the way, the story of how Beethoven came to be Beethoven and thought of in such revered terms is one of the things that I wanted to explore. So each chapter takes a, a work, takes a piece, takes a theme, and I use this as a way to trace through Beethoven's mature career, if you will. I started around 1800 rather than dealing with the earlier years and was trying to find a range of genres because what, one thing I think quite often happens is that we concentrate on one genre at a time. So you have books about Beethoven's symphonies or concentrated studies, but actually thinking about the different types of music that he wrote was something that I wanted to explore and to bring to light in some ways. When you said it was my own personal canon, I, I, the last thing I wanted to be is a canon. As far as I'm concerned, this is a selection of pieces that introduces um, elements of Beethoven's music and life and brings those together and raises some of the issues around them as well. So that was the way that I wanted to build a narrative up through my study. Yeah, certainly not to imply that this is these are sort of the only nine Beethoven pieces you need yes. to hear this kind of uh, uh, kind of approach that you so often get these days. Um, but it is these these are works that, that that were useful to you in terms of assembling this this multifaceted uh, uh, portrait, and we'll certainly come back to those choices as well. Uh, but just to proceed now to uh, Evan, uh, who has uh, published um, two books in uh, the past year or so on, on uh, Beethoven. Uh, one, uh, uh, an excellent brief, uh, concise uh, life, uh, Beethoven variations on a life. Um, and then the Beethoven uh, syndrome, um, which is uh, much more an interpretive historical study uh, around the question that, uh, that uh, Laura uh, alluded to, um, uh, how Beethoven became Beethoven, uh, uh, the, the emergence uh, of this uh, mythic figure um, and taking a very striking uh, approach, which I think is related to other work you've done about the uh, emergence of absolute music as, as a genre, about sort of romantic conceptions of, of genius and the work and and uh, a kind of movement away from from an enlightenment understanding of, of what music uh, expresses to this romantic emphasis uh, on the self on the kind of uh, expression of the dramatic heroic self through music through every other kind of art which really persists you know and i think we, we just th this is still very much the conception of art that we live with and we see it in, in, in popular music as well as uh, classical music uh, so um could you just uh let's sort of maybe sort of concentrate concentrate on 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 that book in particular uh uh, the Beethoven syndrome and and your your sort of aim um, in in putting together this fascinating study. Well, actually, both books began uh, from the same source. Uh, it I was in the front row of a uh, cello recital and uh, listening to the Opus Five cello sonatas, and uh, there are passages in those pieces that are just absolutely hilarious. Um, and I had a direct line of sight to the cellist and just over his shoulder behind him was one of these large scowling busts of Beethoven uh, with big frown. And it struck me, how can somebody that unhappy write music that is so playful and, and joyous and, and just full of, of life and verve? And I, I started thinking about the uh, kind of disconnect between this image of Beethoven or Beethoven in quotation marks, as I think of him, uh, and uh, the actual person. He's kind of been reduced through those statuettes, you know, the kind you see on, on uh, pianos all over the world, uh, to this scowling, unhappy figure. And, and certainly he was unhappy at times. That's, those are very famous episodes. But anybody who's read his correspondence knows that he, was, he also had a wonderful sense of humor. Uh, sometimes a very, um, very dark sense of humor, uh, and uh, was a really more, much more multifaceted figure than than uh, we we take him to be now. Um, the Beethoven syndrome, as I call it, is this tendency to hear him, 
hear the composer in the music. So the, the, to hear the music as an expression of his inner self. And as I began to look at the uh, reception of Beethoven during his lifetime, I was struck by what I didn't find. Uh, I didn't find anybody talking about Beethoven really as an individual. The fact is that people knew almost nothing about him. He was really just a name. Uh, even E.T.A. Hoffmann's famous review of the Fifth Symphony, I don't think Hoffmann knew very much about Beethoven uh, beyond perhaps that he lived in Vienna. Um, I, the news about his deafness didn't begin to leak out until 1815 or so. Um, and so people really saw, I, th I think, uh, a composer who was praised in his time as, as a Proteus, uh, you know, this shape-shifting feature from mythology who could be a dragon one moment and turn into water the next. And they said that with pride, Beethoven, our Proteus, one reviewer wrote. Um, so uh, long story short, I, I began to see that this, this image of Beethoven as expressing his inner self really began to emerge only after he had died, after the Heiligenstadt Testament had been discovered. You know, this, this testament from 1802 that he hid away in a drawer and was found only after his death when he confronts his growing deafness and realizes that uh, he, he, he has a mission. Uh, he had contemplated suicide, but felt that he still had works uh, within him that had to be written. And that changed everything. And so he dies in 1827. And in 1830, Berlioz writes the Symphony Fantastique, which is all about himself. And, uh, and we're off to the races. And that's the way we tend to hear music nowadays. But it's not the way uh, Beethoven's contemporaries heard him. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, it's a really fascinating insight. And one, one of several examples of, of the way in which Beethoven uh, has uh, affected musical life sort of far beyond the, the sort of influence of the music itself, uh, but, the, but the image of Beethoven, the kind of the myth of Beethoven has, has really shaped our conception more widely of, of who artists are, uh, as well as sort of shaping concert life and the, the emergence of what we think of as, as classical music concert life uh, uh, is, is rooted in, in, in Beethoven in many ways. That's something else we can uh, come back to. Uh, but let me uh, now turn to uh, Bill, uh, William Kinderman. Um, uh, who has written uh, Beethoven, a political artist uh, in revolutionary times. Uh, so here, uh, obviously, we are moving into the realm of, of uh, Beethoven's uh, legendary uh, presence um, as a political figure. Um, and something that occurred to me uh, reading your book, and this is sort of a, a, a topic that surfaces from time to time, is uh, in Beethoven scholarship in recent decades, uh, there has been something of a turn away from uh, seeing Beethoven as a liberatory uh, revolutionary uh, uh, figure in alliance with, with, uh, with democratic uh, uh, politics and sort of liberal politics. Uh, there's been some emphasis among uh, some scholars uh, uh, tying him to uh, more reactionary modes of uh, political thinking, especially in this period, uh, the, the second uh, decade uh, of the 19th century in, in the period of uh, Metternich's uh, uh, Vienna and uh, the, uh, the, the, that reactionary regime. Uh, so it struck me that, that your book was, <clears throat> to some extent, pushing back uh, against uh, that, that scholarship and, and reasserting uh, uh, Beethoven's uh, revolutionary uh, credentials as, as, the, as the title uh, does uh, suggest. So it, did that have something to do with the sort of the origin of your book or is this simply a, a longstanding uh, project that, that you had wanted to uh, put on paper in terms of this political uh, study? <clears throat> Thank you, Alex. Uh, like Evan, I spent the 2016-17 year in Vienna, and that's where the uh, book came together. And like you, I'm all in favor of the general principle of keeping Beethoven weird and wild. Um, and so I don't want to simply reassert uh, the stereotype Beethoven as a champion of liberal thought. Uh, at the same time, um, my renewed study of Beethoven's cultural and political context 
uh, made me even more sensitive to the fact that he dealt with polarized politics in an extreme form. And I'd submit that that's one reason why Beethoven in the last generation, even in the last years, has probably gained in relevance for the present day. When you think that Beethoven came of age and enrolled as a student at the University of Bonn uh, in 1789, the year of revolution, the same year that his um, revolutionary mentor, Ologius Schneider, who was later guillotined, uh, and uh, his um, important um, influence, um, the poet and philosopher Friedrich Schiller uh, took a position in, as professor of history. Um, Beethoven is full of the Enlightenment convictions and idealism of this moment in history, and then only three years later in 1792 makes the passage to Austria that has become a very reactionary state for reasons that can be well understood when we recall that Emperor Franz, who was the emperor during the entire period that Beethoven spent in Vienna until 1827, was none other than the nephew of Marie Antoinette, who was guillotined together with her royal husband in 1793. So Beethoven moves from liberal, the liberal Rhineland to the reactionary environment of culturally rich, but otherwise a very tricky political environment in Austria where he felt himself a foreigner. And Beethoven's um, optimism about Napoleon some years later when Napoleon is first consul of the French Republic was a risky gambit uh, when one looks at the political situation that pertained in Austria. And when one looks further through Beethoven's career, say to the Metternich period, uh, it seems to me that it's quite uh, short-sighted to think that you can ally Beethoven's cultural project as a whole with the reactionary turn. If you know the conversation notebooks and the other sources, they utterly contradict that viewpoint. And the most influential um, of those works is after all the Ninth Symphony with Deep Roots and Bonn and with Schiller and posited against the um, current of the times. Um, the fact that I spent a good bit of time looking at the Beethoven sources, I found useful in some ways. For instance, that the Beethoven Ninth Symphony was for Beethoven himself um, a somewhat risky project, and he um, considered the possibility uh, to an advanced stage that he would not use the Schiller text at all, but he would have an alternative instrumental finale. The debris from that project ends up in one of the most despairing of all his works, the A minor quartet, opus 132. Um, and if we look back to other works from earlier, one finds um, through an intensive look at a famous work like the Fifth Symphony, how in the finale, the, the mode of dum ba dum bum da 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 dum is actually keyed in almost indisputably with la liberté. And, and how a project like Beethoven's Fidelio, is, which is based on French models, is shot through and through with the uh, idea of a Schillerian effigy of their ideal. But of course, Beethoven is asserting here not simply a, um, a reminiscence of 1789, but he's recognizing that he's politically between a rock and a hard place. That uh, Austrian politics in that sense was in his view quite hopeless. And Napoleon's um, trajectory after 1804 is also no, nearly hopeless, but uh, Beethoven um, took to heart the Schillerian third path that the artist can nevertheless then posit positive symbols 
and that's one reason, of course, that Beethoven, unlike Mozart, um, that nearly all of his major works end positively, even if hypothetically, with a projected uh, effigy of the ideal. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. And um, I found that an absolutely fascinating passage in your book where you're talking about the interrelationship of this uh, 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 um, uh, projected uh, uh, possible instrumental uh, finale uh, to the Ninth Symphony um, and passages in the Opus 132 uh, quartet, works that seem very far apart from one, uh, one another on so many different levels. And, and to sort of weave them together uh, uh, gives us this picture of, uh, well, I think what, what, uh, what Evan was talking about, the protean uh, Beethoven uh, uh, figure who's, whose ideas were uh, very mutable and not sort of cast in, in stone uh, the way we tend to think of them. Um, but on the subject, I mean, this is this is such a rich uh, uh, topic in itself, and we could we could spend the, the rest of the time talking about it. Beethoven's politics. Um, does anyone else want to to uh, jump in here with with uh, uh, thoughts about that, about the uh, the trajectory of of uh, Beethoven's politics and ways in which it might be uh, manifest uh, in in the work itself? Jan, in, in your biography, um, did you, uh, how did you handle sort of the, 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 the political uh, theme in, in uh, Beethoven? Um, and uh, did you feel that there are sort of pitfalls and sort of preconceptions about Beethoven's politics that you wish to uh, avoid or sort of a particular perspective on this matter that you wanted to uh, bring forward? Um, the very, very um delicate uh, and complicated theme uh, because uh, you can't find a lot of um, quotes from Beethoven about it. It's, it's very, very difficult to judge. Um, but for example, um, because uh, I'm a conductor and, and, and uh, uh, I was trying always to do, to make making links uh, between uh, biography and, and, and the music. You can uh, speak about, for example, the Fifth Symphony, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very fascinating work. Um, and we, we all know that, that, that it was initial idea to, to, to write the symphony immediately or even in combination with, with the Eroica. Uh, to present himself in, in, in Paris. So it's, it's, it's thought like an, uh, even a French, French piece. And then it's very, in this piece, it's very fascinating to see you have it's C minor. You have the, the, the transition uh, between um, the C minor at the beginning of the piece, and then you have a long transformation uh, coming up to, uh, the C major. It already in the in second movement, third movement, and then you have the finale in in in, in major. So let's say a movement from 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 dark to light. Yeah? What is the kind of metaphor? Yeah? Uh, but for me, it's, it was very fascinating uh, to, to feel that this is not only a transition between between uh, uh, dark and light, the old uh, society and the new society. Yeah? But a transition from uh, a German orchestra sound in the beginning. So the first three movements are in traditional um, German uh, instrumentation, with the means with, with uh, um, two flutes, two oboes, two, two clarinets, and so on. Uh, no trombones, uh, 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 only trumpets, horns, two horns, two trumpets, and, and a timpani. And then in the last movement, in the moment when, when, when finally you have the, you have the, the, you have the, the, the C major, um, you have this, this new French sounds. It means uh, you have one piccolo more, you have a uh, uh, contrabassoon, you have the three trombones. Uh, all instruments uh, from this, this typical French revolutionary uh, style. Uh, like we find it with, with Gossek and, and Reicha and so on. 
the means that the, 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 the transition from, from the beginning of the piece C minor to, to, to um, uh, C major, uh, old society, new society, uh, German orchestra sound, German culture to French culture. And I, I mean, this is a, a very interesting idea uh, that, that we have this new uh, sound as a political statement. That's an example of the, the um, uh, interaction between his political ideas and real uh, musical facts. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a, a very telling example. Uh, Laura, <clears throat> in your book, um, I think in, in all of your books, in, in various ways, uh, you are contending with uh, received images of Beethoven, and especially this this constant emphasis on the heroic. Um, and of course, for so many of us, the the heroic voice in, in Beethoven manifest in the Eroica Symphony, in the Fifth Symphony, uh, uh, the the Ninth Symphony is is what drew us, you know, perhaps um, in in our youth uh, to the composer. Um, but there is, of course, a great deal more to Beethoven than that. Um, how did you, in your choice of of uh, works, I, I think just the, the choices that you made, uh, uh, sort of. Uh, very much uh, sort of encourage us to to uh, look past uh, that dominant image, even as of course you you touch on these uh, famous works and have a chapter on the uh, on the uh, Eroica. But to begin with the septet, which is of course a very very different uh, piece and a very different uh, image of Beethoven. And it was precisely because it was a different image of Beethoven that it appealed to me as a starting point. Also because it's part of this concert, which is one of the first real public successes that he has in his career. So when we've spoken already about actually how well Beethoven was known during his lifetime or aspects of Beethoven were known during his lifetime, I was always curious to find instances where the story goes slightly against our expectations. It's rather like what we've just been talking about with politics and actually how much we're then thinking about French revolutionary politics and ideas which are embodied in sound perhaps, or in the people he revered or responded to. But actually when we think about the reception of Beethoven, so much concentrates on the Germanic image of him. And all of these things become very um, enmeshed in ways that I think means we need to be alert to actually our position interpreting and the, the decades between and the different layers of history that have been added on as much as going back to what we think was happening around 1800. The septet I wanted to start with in part, just to return to your question, because it does, does show a very different aspect of Beethoven making music, making music with the people around him, which I think is very important. Again, coming back to these myths of the very solitary figure of Beethoven, actually thinking about who his collaborators were seemed important. And then this idea that actually he was known best for a work that is more easily melodious, is perhaps harking back more to 18th century models than the kind of heroic revolutionary narrative that we tend to focus on. Yeah, and conversely, we, we now prize very highly uh, works of Beethoven, especially the, the later works, the quartets, uh, uh, which uh, were, were quite difficult uh, uh, to audiences uh, in, in their time when they were first heard um, and you know, did not at that time really at all define the, the image of the, of the composer. Um, Evan, you know, as as you talk about the emergence of this this mythic Beethoven, uh, the man full of stormy feeling, uh, the the scowling uh, Beethoven, uh, 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 oppressed, uh, uh, isolated, uh, communicating his his emotions on the page, creating images of himself um, on on the page. You, you talk about how different uh, that, that romantic image is from how Beethoven was described and sort of talked about in his uh, day, much less mention or even no mention whatsoever uh, of this, this personal image, which was simply not widely known. And yet, you know, given the Heiligenstadt Testament, uh, uh, given these, these, these moments where, where, where Beethoven uh, as a human being is, is uh, expressing himself in, in very strong terms with, with an image of himself, you know, uh, as 
uh, as this uh, as this embattled figure is this is perhaps an impossible question to, to answer is this a, a sort of image of himself that the Beethoven would have recognized you know or would would, would, would he have would he have found it um, in in a way uh, uh, gratifying uh, to to have his work understood in those sort of later romantic terms you're right we can't know i suspect he would have been surprised because that's simply not the basis on which uh, composers composed music and listeners listen to it um i think listening has actually changed since his time um listening to a s symphony say the fifth uh, take stick with that example. Uh, people were listening, I sense from the many reviews uh, of, of the period um, to their immediate kind of visceral response to it. Uh, they weren't listening structurally the way the way we tend to do, the way we try to get our students to listen um, nowadays. And uh, so the, the idea of, of the work, um, music, music as an object, I think, would have been somewhat foreign to them. I think they thought of music as an experience, listeners I'm talking about now. Uh, and this was one of the problems for Beethoven. He, he, was, uh, he was popular, especially uh, early works like the Septet, as, as Laura points out. Um, but uh, he made listeners work. He presented them with, with music that went against the grain uh, in, in ways that made people wonder, well, why did he do that? And as soon as you start thinking, why did he do that? You're listening to music in a different way from just letting it wash over you. And so this notion of listening as, as work, listening as labor, I think was something that was just beginning to emerge during his lifetime. Uh, and then it became the norm uh, pretty quickly uh, after his death. Yeah, Jan. Yeah, that's it. It's very interesting to to um, uh, to say that Beethoven suggested uh, to put the eroica at the beginning of the concert pro programs because in his mind uh, it's such a um, um, an effort to understand this music that when you have it at the end of the, of the concert the, the the audience is already too tired. So it's very fascinating that he knew that that uh, uh, understanding the eroica does mean that that you should have, with a fresh hat at the beginning of the program. That's a new a new idea, a very important idea in my in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, no. I, could add, uh, I could add something yeah. to that, Alex. Um, yeah, I think that the uh, this blunt notion of the heroic in Beethoven needs to be rethought. And if one looks at what he actually composed in Heiligenstadt, where he hoped that his hearing would improve and it did not. And he, uh, uh, however, wrote a number of important works, uh, the uh, so-called Tempest Sonata, the uh, so-called Prometheus Variations for Piano, which is the springboard to the Eroica Symphony and started on the Eroica. What exactly were the new ideas here? Uh, one of them is a, akin to what uh, is literary critics describe sometimes as deconstruction. He decided with the pre-existing theme associated with the glorification of the Prometheus figure in his ballet music, that he would strip it down to the rather grotesque base alone as the starting for his um, E flat variations and then for the Eroica finale, which was how the Eroica began. So that the uh, actual narrative of the four movements of the Eroica can be recognized as struggle in the great first movement, death in the second, and rebirth in the third with an allusion to the revival of Prometheus, who, who is put to death at one point in the ballet, in the trio with the three horns, and then this a remarkable a creation of a chain of transformative variations that come from, as it were, just a grain of sand, an incomplete fragment. 
And uh, when Beethoven was asked many years later or heard that Napoleon had died, and he replied with typical irony, he'd already written the music for that catastrophe. Surely he was referring to the fact that the Eroica had the funeral march as the second movement. Napoleon was already then disqualified for hero heroism because he had given up and become somebody who embraced authority and power and absolute uh, kind of uh, had become a tyrant. And this is the anti-hero for Beethoven. Uh, the same way, and, and the deficit, for example, what Beethoven could no longer control or no longer hear becomes the projected ideal, just as Florestan, the imprisoned freedom fighter in the dungeon in the last act of the opera, he imagines this oboe uh, ascending and has a duet with that, and the oboe represents the absent uh, beloved and also the angel of freedom at the same time, Leonora, who's about to achieve access to the forbidden chamber and unman the tyrant Pizarro and rescue all of the political prisoners. So it's a typical uh, configuration in which Beethoven is critiquing conventional um, notions of heroism uh, along fresh lines. And I think this is very inadequately understood to the present day. Yeah, absolutely. And I've always felt struck by the fact that the, the destination of this heroic, uh, monumental, sort of elementally romantic symphony is this finale, which is so playful, uh, so festive, uh, carnivalesque at times, uh, weird, uh, one could say, um, and and um, finally sort of bordering on the absurd with the with the uh, uh, the endless um, uh, uh, kind of uh, banging away at, at chords of uh, E flat major, uh, and so the the this but this destination is, is I think very important to keep in mind. And nothing is more typical of Beethoven than that. I think that parallels Jean Paul Richter's idea that you have a dialectic between the commonplace or the trivial and the colossal and the infinite, and each is the critique of the other. The, supply, the sublime is the critique of the commonplace. The commonplace is the critique of the sublime. Hence, for Beethoven, it's so natural that he takes Diabelli's rather trivial um, beer hall waltz, writes his longest work for piano, uh, on it, the Diabelli variations, and allows that project to spill over so that you feel its influence in the sublime transformations of the Arietta and his last sonata, Opus 111, culminating in a kind of idealized uh, effigy of the ideal with the trill on the high G and the coda, which is a kind of spiritualized version, I think, of that piccolo trill way back in the Fifth Symphony coda. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a, a, a very compelling through line here, um, but one to see it clearly, we need to combine certain of aspects of the political, cultural environment with aspects of biography and know the music too. Yeah, very much so. Um, let's switch for a moment and talk about performance. And I'd love to hear your thoughts as Beethoven scholars, and uh, for some of you as performers uh, yourselves, um, about how uh, Beethoven performance has, has evolved um, in recent years. What, what do you feel are some, sort of some, some striking new approaches uh, to, to Beethoven performance, or perhaps some approaches which you find less satisfying in terms of a, a calcification of, of uh, style? Does anyone have... Um, thoughts about, about the sort of state of, of uh, Beethoven performance, as obviously we've, we've long left behind the kind of romantic <clears throat> early uh, mid-century uh, uh, style and the, the sort of advance of period performance practices have, have uh, given a much sort of sharper, finer edge uh, to, to Beethoven performance. But there are alternatives as well in circulation. I, I think uh, performers are, are very much uh, discovering that humor is not an isolated thing in Beethoven, that it's really everywhere, uh, and that it, it relates uh, to this kind of dialectic that Bill was talking about between 
um, the uh, the commonplace and the sublime. Um, and if, almost every page of his music uh, has has this kind of tension between the two. Um, so I think it's I, th I think there's a very welcome tendency to uh, take a a broader view of the music that that uh, doesn't isolate those moments that are obviously and, and very uh, clearly funny, you know, laugh inducing, um, but really are, are puzzling. You know, I think of the end of the Serioso string quartet, it was 95, uh, where after a very long brooding uh, three movements, uh, suddenly it bursts into laughter. Um, and uh, that's, I, I think we, I think we're beginning to see that this is all um, uh, parts of the same puzzle. I completely agree. And um, I rather think that the enemy of good and interesting performance today is taking too much the sense that, oh, these are masterworks and they have to be performed literally according to the text. If one knows the Beethoven sources, you know how if he turned back to one of his works, he found it apparently almost impossible not to find further improvements and refinements. We know that when he himself played a work like the Fourth Piano Concerto, even for a piece like that, he added notes. Uh, the dramatic symbolism that one has, say, in the Egmont Overture at the moment, at the just before it bursts into the uh, F major apotheosis, which parallels that quartet that Evan just mentioned. There's a moment there that signifies the death of Count Egmont. Uh, and probably it's a minority of listeners or conductors who realize how important that is. One should probably take extra time, set up that void, that black hole in the, um, in the action. Uh, we're, we, uh, in thinking that we know these works well, we're deluding ourselves. They, uh, they need an infusion of freedom that is often lacking. Yeah. Laura? I, th I think one way in which that freedom is maybe being accessed in interesting ways is actually with some of the historically informed performance practices who are looking more at 19th century practices now than earlier times and using some of those techniques to open up ways of playing and also playing things like the arrangements of Beethoven's music from the 19th century, which of course were the way that a lot of people got to know his music as well. I have a question actually, if I may, which is about programming. Um, because actually when we're thinking about performance now, I think one of the ways in which we have got into a habit is doing cycles of things. And one of the interesting things about the effect of pandemic related business in the last year is actually some of the big cycles of symphonies say or the multiple performances of Fidelio haven't happened and I wonder whether that's something that's just going to return automatically or whether actually that opens up the possibility of not only programming Beethoven in one go but actually experimenting with different ways of presenting him. Yeah, well this is actually the, the very next question that I wanted oh, right. to ask was, <laughs> was about the Beethoven year <clears throat> about the, the uh, you know, a, as these programs were being announced, um, uh, critics and observers, myself included, had moments of exasperation because there was just so much of it. Uh, um, and uh, you know, Carnegie Hall was going to devote something like a, a fifth of its entire season to, to Beethoven. And, you know, as much as we uh, love the music, it, it, these it's a continuing problem with this with this uh, mentality of, of anniversary driven uh, programming. And so you get this, this overload uh, at, at certain moments of Mozart, of, of Mozart and, and Bach. And of course, this doesn't apply to any of you because as you know, Beethoven scholars or scholars who work very much on, on Beethoven, you are simply uh, doing your job in terms of continuing to scrutinize uh, the composer. But, but yeah, in terms of programming, it is, it is a longstanding issue. Uh, Beethoven is, is a very familiar, uh, he's always been uh, the most or one of the most uh, often programmed uh, composers. So what, uh, what more can we gain uh, with uh, programming during an anniversary year? And, and, and so yeah, what are, what are some of your, uh, uh, the rest of you thoughts about, you know, how can we program him at a moment like this in, in, in ways that really does furnish some kind of new 
perspective, not only on him, but you know, on his contemporaries, on his successors, on contemporary music, um, on the political issues that, that are, arise uh, around him and everything else. I think it would be wonderful to have more juxtapositions, uh, say, if if you perform Beethoven, perform a Czerny symphony as well, or uh, a, a Reicha symphony, as I believe Jan has, has uh, conducted and even recorded. Am I correct? I, I the, uh, recorded the Reicha symphonies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is terra incognita for most for most of us, uh, scholars included. Yeah. Uh, the, the music just simply... Mm -hmm stands in the shadow of, of Beethoven, but I think it would tell us a lot more about Beethoven if we could hear more of it. Yeah, talk about Rijka just for a moment, so just sort of make a perhaps unexpected uh, uh, detour, Jan, but, but something that has always struck me, and I think of a conversation I had with uh, the harpsichordist and conductor Christophe Mousset, uh, who was a great exponent of uh, Salieri, um, uh, among other composers, and who believes very strongly that that by sort of stripping the entirety of music history down to a few grand figures and kind of getting rid of everyone else, uh, we end up with a, with a quite, you know, a historical view of what was really going on in these periods. And he compares it to walking into a gallery in a museum uh, where you see the Caravaggios, you see the famous names, but you also see, you know, the, the members of the sort of school of this painter, uh, that painter, sometimes you don't even know the name of the painter. Uh, but, you know, as we walk through a museum, you know, it's not all one thundering masterpiece and, and one famous name after another. It's we get a, the texture uh, of the work of the period. And so to conduct someone like Reiko or Czerny or, or Ferdinand Ries uh, is it, it sort of gives you the, the texture of, of, of Beethoven's uh, period. And with a good enough performance, you can, you can make a, a very good case for, for these composers, even if ultimately, you know, we're gonna go back to <laughs> Beethoven with the sense that he was at a somewhat higher level. So yeah, to tell us about your experiences with Reika, some of these other composers. May I, yeah. may I give yeah. a, a, a reflection from my experience? So, um, the, the, the point is, why are we playing Beethoven today? Huh? That's a basic uh, question. And, 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 and the reason why we, we, why we play Beethoven is, or for me, there are two reasons. The first is that um, it's um, very strong music hmm, that touch touches us in our deepest, deepest feelings. Hmm? So we forget that Beethoven isn't music of our time. It's absolute uh, um, uh, music of, of today. Music is part of our life. Hmm? Um, and we forget the gap of 200 years. Yes. Yeah? Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is um, that's uh, for the, the audience and, the, and the, the, the players and the conductors is every time when you are in contact with Beethoven, there are new ideas. You have the feeling, oh, I, I see, I hear new things. And, and, and you, you say, okay, why is it possible that I, I already did a hundred times the Eroica, that I, I feel new relationships that I, I, I never could, could, I never heard before. And this is a kind of richness um, and it's uh, endless. And that whereas when you, when you so I, I made, made recording of the Raja Symphony and 10, year, 10 years later, I retook the Raja Symphony um, as part of a program with, 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 the, with the Eroica and there was no new idea. There was no new horizon, no new um, vision. Uh, it, it was the same, let's say, emptiness, even. Eh? And 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 then I have the feeling, okay, we played, and it's very interesting for us to to, to make the, com the comparison with, with Beethoven to compare it, but it doesn't touch us anymore. More, and that's the difference with, with Beethoven and. 
and um, uh, you know, in, in, in the, uh, the, all the all the music of Beethoven carries a unique, let's say, a unique fingerprint huh? and, and a kind of quality assurance label, you could say. Huh? And that you you can't you can't say from from Reicher. and and it's it's a rather ob objective um, from an historical uh, uh, point of view, but we don't have the same relationship with this music. Mm. That's my my experience. And 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 after after three concerts, I, I was happy that I could could finish this project. Whereas with Beethoven, when you have a tour and you 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 are you are doing ten times the eroica. It's a bit of that that you have to stop. Yeah. You know, it might like be. A, yeah. The uh, piano music is probably more kind of original and interesting than the symphonic music, but it's intellectual, it's emotional, it's on all yeah. the levels. May yeah. I, may I uh, uh, no, say one thing about uh, interpreting, uh, in, uh, playing Beethoven? I think the, the, uh, one of the most important thing, things we have to do the next years. Yeah? We have to have more courage to to integrate rubato in playing Beethoven. To have more flexibility in the tempos of Beethoven. And, uh, so we, we, we are playing it too too rigid. rigid. And and then that's a little bit of, uh, the same thing what what Laura uh, was, was was telling. So um, uh, the. Um, um, all those different different uh, feelings mm, are um, more working when you have the courage to 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 um, yeah to be more flexible. You know, yeah, I, I agree with much that Jan is saying, and uh, I do think that even keeping to Beethoven's music, there are some still unexploited opportunities. For instance, uh, since you mentioned the Eroica, I would really appreciate seeing and experiencing a, a fully satisfactory ballet realization of the creatures of Prometheus to begin a program and then follow it perhaps by a very good rendition of the piano variations opus 35 take an intermission and then hear the eroica uh, uh, may i say yeah. we did uh, this project in a tour um, in germany five years ago this idea we already did it's wonderful and then you hear you hear uh, the eroica in a total different way absolutely i agree Sorry. <laughs> well, it should be done more often then. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I actually agree very much with Jan's point about uh, rigidity, uh, and especially with orchestral performances, not nearly so much with performances, the piano sonatas and uh, the uh, string quartets. And, and I think uh, just in the past couple of years, there have been some wonderfully characterful uh, and varied readings of the quartets from the Eben Quartet, for example, and uh, Igor Levitt's cycle of the piano sonatas, which, which uh, emphasized very strongly the wit, the playfulness, uh, the, the kind of <clears throat> eccentric humor uh, in Beethoven. But when it comes to the symphonies, I, I often feel as though I'm, I'm sort of hearing the same performance over and over again. Um, very exact, very driven, uh, a kind of punchiness, a kind of vividness, it's, it's, it sort of grabs you, um, uh, but there's also a kind of a sameness and, and uh, the, the tempos are on the fast side. Um, and, uh, and I feel as though, and it's obviously an approach which is informed by, by historical performance practice and, and uh, 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 kind of moving away from a sort of over rich uh, a sort of saturated uh, sound, a kind of Furtwängler sound, and, and I'm not thinking that we should necessarily go back to that. Um, but yes, to have an approach which is more flexible in terms of tempo, more rubato, more spontaneous, uh, and, and less of this kind of, you know, uh, uh, sort of just sort of hammering, rhythmically kind of hammering away. That's this is an approach I've heard a lot. Yes. Um, may may I uh, say one thing more? One of the consequences 
from this approach is the, 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 the problem of the metronome and uh, numbers is much greater because um, when when you really so I'm, I, I I I had this this uh, period in my life because of my so-called historical inf um, inf information um, uh, attitude and as a, as a, as a musicologist, I had the idea, okay, we should take them very seriously and, and, and literally. And the more uh, you are concentrated as a, as a conductor with the language and, and, and speaking, and, and being flexible, the, the less it's possible to keep the, the original tempi. Mm -hmm. So this tempi are, are give you some, some idea of direction, uh, a point of reference, but you have to, to leave them. Yeah. Uh, Laura, will you say something? Actually, this would take us off in a slightly different direction. I fully agree no, the more flexible no. and lively thing. I was actually going to suggest something which might be deeply unpopular, but thinking about the kind of museum aspect of concert, concert life and contemporary music and how these two things um, interact together in the sense that if you think during Beethoven's lifetime, there was an increasing interest in older music, but actually most music that was being heard in concert was contemporary. And to what extent now we've gone to these, we tend to hear older music and have the contemporary as the exceptional piece on a program. If you, it, if you change these things around again, so you have the older piece as the exceptional piece on the program and the contemporary music around it, then actually it'd be one way of actually uh, sort of opening up dialogue between the years rather than having the kind of classical canonical aspect of a program and then at your token new music, you actually switch these things around. I think things like that as well would also help because in a very different direction from the kind of looking at Beethoven's contemporaries and thinking about those aspects of historical performance, but actually helps us engage in actually what concert life means now. Cause I think it has, and it's going to have to change quite a lot in the next few years. Again, yeah. uh, I think that kind of thing has been tried. Um, I think back to the last Monse festival that Andras Schiff uh, oversaw in which Beethoven and Bach were featured composers along with Holliger and Jerzy Kortag. Very stimulating period of two and a half weeks, but it's not typical and it should be done more often. But then, then the question is, which is the contemporary music of today? Which is the music of our time? Is this uh, Kortag, Holliger, or is, or is this uh, David Bowie? Is it easier to say who's Reicher than who's Beethoven? <laughs> well, no matter what the programming is, I think uh, uh, is something that's always concerned me as a critic um, is the overemphasis on the, the almost exclusive emphasis of the old uh, uh, against the new. And as, as someone who uh, attempted to be a composer in my youth, uh, I've, I've always sort of written very much from the point of view of the contemporary, the living composer, it's sort of always been my preoccupation. And so I've, I've sort of campaigned, uh, of course, one of innumerable uh, 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 critics and commentators and musicologists who have campaigned for a sort of greater representation of new music, often in vain, um, because the because the pull of the old music is so strong. And I think the great contradiction that Beethoven presents us with, and maybe this can be sort of our closing point to comment on is, is a composer whose, whose uh, appeal is so powerful, um, uh, whose, whose work demands to be heard again and again. I think this, yeah. this, the, this was the, the, the phenomenon that you begin to see already in the first decade of the 19th century. We need to hear it again to really understand it. Um, and and just the, the, the notion of the classical repertory was already in, in formation and you already had Handel, you know, was being performed after his death. Mozart operas uh, stayed in the repertory after his death. But as uh, the, the concert culture, modern classical concert culture, especially orchestral culture, really forms, gestates uh, from Beethoven. Uh, and so we're left with this contradiction of this enormously original, innovative, unpredictable, uh, uh, a 
figure becoming monumentalized um, and 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 becoming the the uh, the such a dominant uh, uh, figure that even in the later nineteenth century, uh, composers are, are are beginning to feel a struggle to to find a place um, in this in this culture dominated by the past. And that's it's a it's a very strange phenomenon. And I think it's something I personally feel that Beethoven would have found utterly baffling um, and perhaps infuriating. You know, I, I guess there's no sign in anything he ever said that that he wanted to sort of have this this dominant place in in posterity, lording over <laughs> music uh, for the rest of time. Uh, it just seems it seems quite alien to his uh, uh, temperament. Um, so yeah, perhaps we can close with that. Sort of some comments on on uh, Beethoven's supreme place in in in, in uh, concert culture and how we sort of move past that without losing touch with those qualities that, that keep pulling us back to Beethoven. Evan, do you I want think to one could, one might emphasize and, and, and recognize more Beethoven's wit. Um, for example, um, with our very troubled politics of the last years in this country, repaired recently, uh, one was reminded of the relevance of something like his marvelous setting of the flea song from Goethe's Faust uh, with the text, the king had a favorite flea and the flea of course takes his position in court, is given special honors and everyone else in the political environment is bitten and tormented by fleas, but they can't complain. But the end, the chorus of this marvelous song is, but if we are bitten, we will crush the fleas. And Beethoven writes the special fingering 1-1 one, one, to actually physically crush the parasites on the keyboard. What a marvelous critique of favoritism and corruption in politics that is. Yeah. Yeah, Evan, to come back yep. to your point about the protean Beethoven, it strikes me that, you know, if Beethoven is protean, if he is a shapeshifter, then we, we can't actually monumentalize him in that way. We can't make a bust out of him, you know, if his face keeps changing. And so that's, I think, your, your emphasis on that older image of Beethoven is perhaps something that we, we now need to return to. Uh, to yeah, we've, we've, we've made a bust of certain of his works. Um, uh, anthropomorphize them in a way. Um, but, you know, Bill's reference to the song, The Flea is a good reminder of all these wonderful, wonderful songs uh, that Beethoven wrote that rarely uh, compared to say Schubert uh, get, get performed. It's, it's kind of odd that in, in um, you know, at the time Schubert was in Beethoven's shadow and now as far as songs are concerned, it's the exact opposite. But there's a lot of Beethoven's music that uh, doesn't get performed. Um, and that uh, doesn't conform to the scowling figure. Um, my favorite example uh, is Opus 54, the piano sonata, two movements, absolutely zany work. Um, and what's Opus 55? The Eroica Symphony. You couldn't imagine two works more different. Um, I'd, I'd like to see Opus 54 played more often, um, probably not on the same concert, but that would make a nice juxtaposition too, if you could somehow manage it. Yeah. Well, alas, I think we now need to, to wrap things up because we've uh, reached the end of our appointed uh, time. Um, but I just want to thank uh, all of you uh, for this, uh, this very rich conversation. And, and we could, of course, gone on much longer. But uh, I urge those watching uh, to explore these books and then go back to Beethoven and think through the, the implications of, of these uh, ideas uh, and these challenges uh, to our received images of Beethoven that, that emerge uh, from all of your, your books, uh, which I just gained so much personally from, from reading. So, so thank you all. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Um, I love the suggestion um, that in order to, uh, to that, that to move beyond Beethoven might be the best way to understand him um, and um, and that to, to keep Beethoven weird, you know, go listen to Reicher and Czerny and or explore the outer reaches of the Beethoven corpus and then um, especially at a time when um, there's such a greater sensitivity to the way 
cultural space is co-opted by the happy few um, and uh, there's this intense reductionism. So um, thank you for that. Um, and uh, you should absolutely, all uh, of you listening should procure for yourself the books that we uh, discussed tonight. Um, they are available for sale at 192 Books, which is on 10th Avenue. Uh, but you can also email us uh, with your order uh, at uh, info at 192books.com. Excuse me, info at 192books.com. Uh, the bookstore is open for safe, uh, socially distant browsing every single day between 11 and 5, uh, and we close at 6 on Fridays and Saturdays. Uh, you can also order copies on our bookshop page, which is on the link below the screen. And there will be a recording of this conversation posted on our PCG studio website, that is pcg-studio.com. Um, our next event um, might have some very interesting resonances with um, the one tonight because it is on Keats and on a book of uh, a new book by Anna Hitner Sessian on Keats Odes. Um, and it will be a conversation with uh, Narcessian and um, Zoe Kazan. So that will be on March 9th, if I'm not mistaken. The information is on the website. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. <laughs>